Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, can you can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so okay. Um, so I'm a postdoc at, uh, as um, um, presented by Professor uh, Shah at the University of Trento. And, uh, louder, ah, sorry. Okay. Um, this is not actually. The uh, okay. Um, ah, okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So um, I, I just start with um, introducing my uh, research areas for people who are possibly interested in a collaboration uh, with me. Um, and uh, okay, uh, I will stay here uh, a couple of months, a bit less. So uh, these are the research areas in which I've been uh, working, uh, maybe too many topics, but uh, okay, the main, the main topic uh, is object detection. And um, uh, currently, Currently, uh, I'm working on uh, transfer learning, and uh, I'm uh, sort of moving to deep learning. Um, the, the talk of today um, concerns uh, transfer learning, um, more specifically domain adaptation for uh, pedestrian detection. And uh, it's a paper uh, uh, which has been uh, accepted at uh, next ECCB. So the problem uh, is this, um, as you probably know, um, if you have a classifier which is trained uh, on a specific uh, data set with a specific setting, uh, and then you test uh, this, uh, you use, you test this classifier in another data set, um, you usually observe a, a drop of performance, a drastic drop of performance. Um, because the, the training data set usually do not represent all the variability uh, of, of the class uh, that you want to recognize. So um, when you go to another setting with a different uh, image resolution, with a different viewpoint and so on, usually you have a drastic drop of performance. This is a well-known problem and of course the trivial solution is to, to collect uh, to collect another train, uh, training set and uh, to train uh, the classifier from uh, scratch. But uh, this is uh, a, a quite expensive operation, a time-consuming operation, so the goal is to automate or partially automate this, uh, this operation. Um, this is an example of what you, uh, you have. If you use a generic pedestrian detector, a state-of-the-art uh, a standard state, uh, generic de uh, pedestrian detector uh, on a typ typical video surveillance uh, scenario. So uh, this, this image is taken from the MIT traffic uh, data set and this is the Chuck Square da uh, data set. Uh, in both cases we have videos taken uh, from a camera in a far field so the resolution is very low. There are vehicles so um, obstacles or occlusions, the viewpoint is very different from the usual viewpoint, from the common viewpoint used in common training data sets such as IRIA and so on. So this is what happens. Uh, as you can see there are a lot of false positives. The generic detector here is the Dallar and Triggs HOG plus, plus SVM detector, which is a bit old. But if you use more sophisticated detectors in this scenario, you have even worse performances because, um, for instance, the fencer swap detector, uh, which is a part-based detector, um, uh, needs to recognize, to detect the subparts of the human body in a sufficiently high resolution. So if you use the fencer swap detector in this scenario, you have even worse uh, um, performance. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, here I spend just a couple of slides uh, to introduce what is dom domain ad adaptation, uh, just uh, for people who are possibly not uh, familiar with this topic. So, the, the, the goal in uh, transfer learning and in domain adaptation is uh, to train a classifier uh, on a target uh, domain uh, for a target data set. But we can also use a source. Uh, we can also use a source data set, where the source data set uh, is uh, usually supposed to be labeled. So we have uh, labels for S. For instance, in the case of uh, pedestrian detection, you can suppose uh, the test is the S is the 
area uh, data set or the Pascal data set and uh, T is your uh, video surveillance or whatever uh, scenario and the aim is that we want to transfer somehow knowledge from the source domain to the target domain uh, a bit more formally a domain is uh, usually defined uh, by a feature space and a distribution on this feature space and uh, the, the data set uh, is a collection of samples from this feature space with the labels uh, the same also for the target domain uh, in the target domain we don't have labels so it's a, a, an unsupervised approach and uh, other assumptions are this uh, we assume that the, features, the target feature space and the source feature space are, are the same for instance the hog feature space but the distribution is different so you, you can think that uh, the distribution of the pedestrians in this feature space is different because of the resolution or whatever <clears throat> and the goal is to estimate uh, this uh, posterior probability on the target uh, domain using uh, T and S so uh, in, in pedestrian detection uh, one of the most uh, common approaches is uh, more or less uh, um, is like this is, th th this framework is uh, quite common you, you take a generic pedestrian detector um, you run this generic pedestrian detector on the target uh, video on the target images and you collect a set of bounding boxes which are the bounding boxes suggested by uh, the detector from these bounding boxes you extract some features and, this, and, and you have an initial um, data set an initial um, uh, data set of positive samples okay, that you collect automatically of course in this data set there will be some errors but uh, uh, it's completely automatic um, you use this data set, this initial data set uh, together with the source data set in order to train a first classifier and then you run this classifier on the target video in order to collect a second set of uh, training samples which uh, uh, hopefully is better than the first set okay. then you use T2 together with S in order to train a second classifier um, C2 and, and so on until convergence so in, it's in a T1 sorry T1 is, um, T1 is basically just the collection of uh, bounding boxes uh, suggested by generic detector oh, okay, so you apply to uh, generic yes, yes. Uh, this is more or less a framework, a framework which is not the framework we proposed but it's one of the most common framework so uh, the, the problem with this kind of approach is, is drifting which is a a problem which is similar to what happens in the tracking and um, the point is that if the initial data set is full of uh, outliers, is full of uh, wrong pedestrians the, the classifiers will learn the background class and not the, the true class uh, so <clears throat> basically we, we propose to, um, to solve this, uh, this, uh, this problem uh, transforming the problem of outlier rejection in the initial data set in a classifier selection problem and the idea is that basically we take the initial data set we split the data set in different random subset for every subset we train a classifier and then uh, the accuracy of this classifier is estimated using the source data set so the source data set and the target data set are different but somehow are similar this is the implicit assumption in transfer learning so um, we use the source um, classifier as a sort of surrogate to estimate the accuracy of the classifiers then we select a small number of uh, good classifiers and we build an ensemble of classifiers which is our final uh, detector 
in more detail, uh, if it is the initial, that, if it is the initial uh, uh, training set which is uh, given by this. Yes. It means that then you train your model on the source, you first evaluate it and only pick those classifiers which perform well and then uh, run it on the, on the first set of target? Is um, it's, uh, it's the opposite because we train the classifier on the target and then we test on the source. Okay. So the source samples are not used for, uh, for training. Um, in, uh, in most of the domain lab adaptation uh, and the transfer learning approaches, uh, the classifiers are trained uh, mixing uh, source and training uh, uh, samples. In our case we use only uh, sorry, uh, source and target samples. Um, in our case we use only target samples, so positive and negatives are taken from the target domain. Uh, this is because we want somehow to overfit the classifier on the target scenario. So suppose that we have a static camera, a video surveillance camera. I'm not interested in building a generic pedestrian detector that works well in other scenarios. I'm interested in a detector that is specialized for that scenario. So I want an overfitting somehow of, on this scenario. And so, I, in this thing, so, so you start with a generic detector, yes. right? Um, trained on, say, in real detector yes. or something. You apply that to your target domain. Yes. And then from there, one is you're selecting the images which are positive, which, which this generic detector is saying they are human. Yes. And so that's your T, and you do this iterative. So this is your, sir? T, T, data yes. set, the data set T. So then you have the sequence of these T, T1, T2, and so on. So right now you are saying that, and that's traditional people yes. do it. You know, Wang Shu has you know, a Phoenix paper. That's what they do, and then you can do you yes. know, what you are saying. So the new thing you are saying is that instead of taking the T data set, you know, using all of these images to train the new classifier, so you are taking a random subset of those yes. and training maybe n different classifiers. Yes. And then you take those classifiers, evaluate those on the source source data set. Yes. Because for this, you know the ground truth, and you select the one which is yes, exactly, okay. exactly, because the source classifier is labeled. Mm -hmm. and the target is not. So I can use the labels for uh, a quantitative. Uh, assessment of my classifiers. Mm -hmm. Of course it's a rough estimate because of the difference between the two domains, but, uh, but it works. Um, uh, train, uh, your target data set is not labeled? Or no, it's so, not. I mean, if it's not labeled, then how do you select a random subset and actually train a classifier? Well, it runs the already trained classifier on the, on the data set of so the, the target to take, say, the, you know, to take, say, the first one, uh, not to take. Uh, yeah, these two can be separated out. Uh, well, yeah, I'm saying, actually, yeah, but, I mean, the second point here is that different classifiers are trained with different random subsets of T. Of T. T is the data set which he gets okay. as a positive running the generic detector on the target data set. So if it's positive, that doesn't mean it's... It says it is a person, but there may be some wrong. So he's saying traditionally what what Wang uh, would do take all of them and train another one to keep going. But this new thing is that well, don't use all of them. You do the subset, so right. that's the way you do it all right. Um, I don't know if you was also wondering about the negatives. So the negatives are easy to collect because you can just uh, uh, take random uh, windows of your videos. Mm -hmm. So uh, T is just the positives and the random subset of, of T is... Uh, okay, the positives are the, the, the samples which are really important. If you select random uh, sub-windows uh, on your videos, uh, what happens is that uh, sometimes by chance one random sub-window is uh, actually... Um, false positive, uh, a false negative, which means that uh, there is an can be an, uh, an overlapping with the pedestrian. 
So, but this is a quite rare um, uh, event. So both the positives and the negatives are noisy in our approach. So, okay. um, so the, the, the goal here is, is to, to, um, to minimize this uh, uh, generalization error on the target domain, where this is the classifier trained with uh, a subset of the, of the data. And, uh, okay, so, um, um, okay, the, the, best, uh, the best subset should uh, ideally contain the less uh, possible number of uh, wrong pedestrians and also the largest possible number of discriminative samples, which means that uh, I don't want to include in uh, my training set two samples of two pedestrians in a similar position because they are uh, redundant, they are not uh, um, informative. So, since I, don't, I do not have labels for the target domain, I use the, the source domain and uh, I, I use this uh, uh, approximation in which this is a, a loss function, this is the source domain. Um, I will tell you some details more uh, about the loss function. And uh, this is the classifier, which is a common classifier, this is a regularization term. This is another loss function which is, uh, generally speaking, different from this, uh, lambda. Lambda is an inch loss function. Uh, this, uh, this is the, um, the random uh, set of positive and this is the random set of uh, um, uh, windows uh, used as negatives. Um, so, um, okay, so th this, uh, this optimization is a, uh, it's a, a subset optimization problem which is known to be uh, NPR. So we, pro we propose that to minimize uh, this, uh, this uh, objective function using a ransack like approach, which is the strategy that I mentioned to you before. Basically, uh, again, I split the data set in different subsets. For every subset, uh, I, I train a different classifier and I build a vocabulary, a large vocabulary of uh, weak classifiers. Um, then I use this loss function uh, and the source data set to estimate the error associated to every classifier. This is basically the precision, the true positive and the false positives, so a very simple uh, loss function. And, and using these errors I can uh, rank the vocabulary and select the key best classifiers. Uh, okay, there is an analogy with the ransack. Uh, um, I don't know if you are familiar with the ransack, but it's uh, an old technique which is used for uh, um, estimating the parameters of a statistical model. So, if you have um, if you have a set of data A in which you know that there are outliers, but you don't know what are the outliers and what are the inliers. What you can do is uh, this, you, uh, you randomly select the subset of the data set, you estimate the parameters of your model using only this subset, then you verify, this is the verification phase in which you, veri you compute the error using the whole data set, you iterate these steps many times and finally you choose the parameters with the lowest error. So the difference with our approach is that uh, the verification uh, phase is, is done on another data set, on the source data set, and uh, uh, the statistical model is represented by a, a, a classifier. Uh, okay, here there are some training details, basically we use the, the Dala and Triggs approach, uh, uh, holistic uh, OG feature, uh, as linear SVM, uh, one round of boosting, uh, the, the windows are selected, as I mentioned to you before, randomly the first time. The second time, during the bootstrap, we, we check that the hard negatives do not overlap with the, the initial uh, uh, training set T. Uh, and, okay, and that's all for, uh, for the training phase. Uh, for the, um, concerning the testing phase, we proposed another novelty, which is basically this. Okay, uh, the point is that at the end we have an ensemble of classifiers, not just one classifier. So we need to, to reach a consensus in, in the ensemble. Uh, usually consensus, uh, okay, see, this is a, um, an example of what happens here. Um, we use a, a five uh, uh, classifier ensemble. 
and uh, out of five classifiers hit this pedestrian with the different bounding boxes, so with the different uh, windows. And the problem is this, that usually the classifiers do not agree on the same windows. If, even if the windows are clustered around the pedestrians, they do not agree exactly. So usually in a sample classification, uh, every input of the ensemble, which means every window, um, is uh, classified independently and uh, a majority vote is taken on every window independently of the other window. Which means that, for instance, this, this window um, takes only the vote of one classifier and the same for this and so on. Okay. So, I mean, in basically in the classical majority vote for an ensemble decision, there is no uh, spa spatial relation, uh, I mean, we, we cannot um, take into account the spatial relation between uh, windows which are uh, correlated because they are uh, uh, close by. So basically, okay, I think I can skip this because the formula seems to be complicated, but the idea is very simple and intuitive. Basically, we take the decision on the cluster instead of the single window. What we do is we use um, um, a spatial clustering, a common uh, spatial cluster uh, algorithm. Um, so these windows are clustered together. This is not clustered together with the, the other windows because of the scale difference. And on this cluster, we just count the number of different, um, of different classifiers which have contributed to this cluster. So in this case, we have a four out of a five, which is larger than half the cardinality of the ensemble, so the, the decision is positive. Um, we do not weight the classifier, we do not use the confidence of the classifiers, and we do not weight the classifiers. In uh, ensemble decision, usually the classifiers are weighted, because weighting uh, um, a classifier is done in a supervised fashion. We do not have uh, labels for the target the domain, so we do not, we not weight the um, the confidence of every classifier. So every, every classifier counts as one vote. I don't know if it is clear. Intuitively it's very simple, just we take a decision on a cluster instead of a single window. A, majority, a simple majority decision on a cluster. So these are the results and um, this is the MIT traffic data set, this is the Chuck Square. Um, this is obtained with the generic um, the pedestrian detector, which is the Dalal uh, detector. These are true positive, the black uh, boxes are false positives, <coughs> and these are uh, um, false, um, uh, uh, false negatives. And uh, these are obtained with, uh, with our system. And uh, okay, this is a quantitative analysis. So again, this is the MIT traffic, this is the Chuck Square. Uh, okay, here there is something which uh, seems to be a bit strange because uh, we follow with the, the experimental protocol of this guy, Wang uh, and other, um, it's a group in Hong Kong. And basically we, we tested the system both on the train and on the test frames. It seems, it sounds strange, but uh, it is allowed because this is a, a transductive uh, learning, uh, learning paradigm, which means that uh, since we do not use labels, training labels um, for, for training, uh, we can test, people test the system also on the train data. So basically we, we tested, uh, we used the, the same protocol, we tested both on the train frames and on the test frames. But the difference is not so significant. Anyway, um, this is a, the, the red line is our system, and uh, uh, we were able to outperform all the other uh, state-of-the-art uh, systems uh, tested on these benchmarks. And in, in case of the Chuck Square, the difference is uh, quite, uh, I think it's quite uh, significant, quite sharp. Um, this is the Yes, this is Dalen Triggs. I don't know if you can read the, maybe the, the 
characters are a bit small, but anyway, uh, this is the, the, the generic pedestrian detector, the dashed line is the generic pedestrian detector, the performance of the initial detector. Uh, and as you can see, the gap is very, is very large, so it means that uh, unsupervised domain adaptation is, uh, is possible. I mean, we can boost the performance with respect to a generic detector uh, of a large margin. Okay, uh, all the, these experiments have been done with uh, an initial vocabulary of uh, uh, 1,000 classifiers and um, a, final, a final ensemble of uh, five uh, classifiers. This is uh, an experiment in which we show the dependence. Please. Uh, I have a question about the previous slide. Can you please, please um, which one of these have actually, does actually the main adaptation? Um, all the, all the, um, all the systems uh, are domain uh, pedestrian, uh, are domain adaptation for pedestrian detectors, except the dashed line. But what is the, like, how would you explain the, the difference, like the, the performance of these, you know, all the detectors which do use domain adaptation of these different data sets is very different, like, how would you explain that why the black curve is doing much worse than the generic and the train, but much better than the generic and the MI contracted? I don't know. Basically, what, uh, what I did is uh, I, I taken the, the results of uh, Wang uh, of this paper, it's a CVPR um, 2012, uh, and these uh, graphs are taken from that paper. The experiments that I did concern uh, basically our system and also DALA Lentrix. So I repeated this, I, repeat, I, I did this experiment and I repeated the experiment for DALA. I don't know why there is a so large, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this approach is, is based on uh, um, motion, uh, um, uh, motion detection. So they basically take the, as positives uh, the the, the blobs uh, after a motion detection approach, which is uh, probably too rough to give uh, uh, sufficiently uh, good uh, positive samples. So I don't know what, why there is a so large uh, difference in the approaches. Yeah, maybe you can try to finish it. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, okay. Okay, maybe I can um, go um, quicker on this. This is the influence of many classifiers. This is the influence of, uh, of the ensemble cardinality, which is uh, much uh, lower than the, the influence of uh, uh, the initial vocabulary set. This is the difference uh, uh, you have uh, with, the, with the, the standard decision, uh, decision uh, vote for ensembles. Uh, this is a, an experiment in which we, we tested the different loss function. This is a, the, the precision loss function is a, the, the one that we used in, in all the other experiments. This is based on a recall. Here, uh, force negatives and force positives on the source data set are equally weighted. And here, we just uh, uh, randomly uh, selected the five classifiers from the initial vocabulary. And uh, the last experiment, I think, is this, that, which is uh, interesting, because uh, if you compare this with uh, this, uh, so five uh, classifiers selected using uh, the source data set, and here five classifiers selected randomly, or maybe this, uh, here one, uh, just one classifier without ensemble, so here there is no influence of the decision uh, rule. One random classifier and one uh, classifier selected using the uh, source data set, the, the difference in the average precision is uh, quite uh, large, which means that uh, the, the RANSAC like strategy uh, is actually useful. And, uh, okay, as a conclusion, uh, basically the, the main novelty is this uh, RANSAC like strategy for. Uh, uh, transforming the outlier rejection problem in a classifier selection problem, and also the spatial consensus aggregation can help uh, if you have an ensemble of uh, detectors. And that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, originally, I mean, when I tried to
Dante, you said it will be about 15 minutes or so. so uh, sorry, I... I for 30 minutes, but I think this talk can go longer. Okay. So I actually have to catch a flight, so that's why you know, I have to leave early. Uh, but you can continue, and maybe Amin can you know, handle this remaining question, because it's, it's very interesting talk. So, so let me ask you a few questions before I leave. And so one is that you are saying, originally I thought that you would do these different split and you would train these classifiers and you will pick the one which gives you the best uh, on the source domain. Yes. Um, so, but that's not you are doing, you are using several classifiers, not just one, is that right? Exactly. At the end, I have uh, an ensemble of classifiers. So I, I select the. So you select few top ones? Right? Yes. Uh, at the end, we select uh, five uh, classifiers. I see. So now you say there are 1,000 classifiers, which means. Each classifier will have very few examples. Um, we used uh, uh, 200 uh, samples per classifiers, we, we, per classifier, which uh, have been um, mirrored. So at the end, we have 400 positive samples. Oh, mirror, yes. Oh. So for, uh, 400 positive samples and um, um, about uh, 2,000 negatives. Okay. So other question is that see the. The main problem is that you have a generic detector trained on some other data set and you apply that on a target data set and it doesn't work that well and you want to fix that, yes. right? But when you train these new classifiers using the using the, some of the target uh, examples, um, which you can run through the, you know, the generic detector. So you have these detectors, the classifiers. But then in selecting those classifiers, you are using again the source images, is that right? Yes. So is that the right thing to do? Because the whole point is that you want a classifier which works well for the target domain and you already have a very good detector for the source domain. You already have a good detector, good classifier for the source domain. And you got these new classifiers which are supposed to be performing well for the target domain. But in order to select which one are good, you are using the data from the source which is, isn't it, I mean, problem, like it doesn't um, there? Uh, in fact, this is uh, an approximation, yeah. because uh, ideally I want to select the classifiers which perform uh, uh, well on the target domain, yeah. so I would need uh, to test the classifiers on the target domain. Yeah. But uh, since I do not have labels on the target domain, this is a sort of uh, approximation. I, think, I mean, uh, the, mm -hmm. the source data set is a sort of uh, surrogate. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's the only way that I have to estimate the accuracy of the classifiers without uh, using the labels. So the question is, I mean, have you tried uh, this on these data set these guys use? You guys use a different data set, right? Uh, we use videos, like video. talking about town center sequences. Page sequence and town center or something? Uh, no, I will not. This is the video or just single images? Uh, these are uh, videos. Videos also. Uh, no, I have not tested with the um, pet data. And. Uh, um, uh, anyway, okay, uh, the, I think that the PET resolution is a bit higher than, uh, because these images have a very low resolution. This is the reason for which the, the generic detector performs very poorly, but uh, not, uh, I, no, I not uh, tested with uh, PET data. Yeah, maybe you can, you know, test uh, your data on his algorithm. Sure. Uh, you, can, you can give him, I mean, you can test your data on his data, vice versa. Yeah, we have quite available yeah. for, for ours, the kind of resolution yeah. matters. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so you, you can take over. Okay, I have to go.
I'm not sure I understood your, your question because actually we we don't have iterations. I mean, they, uh, we we have just a different uh, um, random split of the training of the target data, but every training for every classifier is done independently from the other. So there is no iteration. Uh, so I, I'm not sure I understood your question uh, because. take negatives and the positive from the target. The negatives are just random sub-windows. So it's true that we don't have labels, but we have implicit labels, which means that the result of the generic, of the generic detector gives me the positive labels for some patches from sub-windows. So the sub-windows which are selected by the generic detector are associated with the positive labels. And then I randomly select sub-windows sub uh, in the videos which are my negatives with the assumption that uh, the other sub-windows are uh, uh, negatives. Mm. Probably not, probably not. 
but uh, I guess that if you use uh, if you use a very high uh, threshold in your generic detector, uh, I think that at the end you have uh, a, a, a set of positives which is uh, uh, almost clean, which is not different from the subset that we randomly uh, take, because in every subset that we randomly select, there is always a, a given number of outliers. So I think that this should be equivalent. But the point is that if you uh, use a, a, a another threshold, a, a high threshold, uh, probably you don't have a sufficient, a sufficient number of, uh, of positive. I mean, if, the, if also the recall of the in, the, in, the, in this uh, in this videos, uh, uh, okay, maybe he, not not here, but uh, in. Um, in, uh, in this video, so the dollar and tricks uh, detector uh, uh, has a lot of false positives, but also a lot of false negatives. I mean, uh, the, the recall is uh, is uh, low. So, if you if you use a high threshold, uh, the risk is that you don't have uh, sufficient data. But in principle, yes, if you have a, a very long video sequence uh, uh, using a high threshold, probably it should be sufficient. I mean, if you can compensate uh, uh, with a very long video the low recall of the, of the classifier, uh, that should be fine. That's kind of what we did. We divided the detections into three sets, like very confident one, the one with very low confidence, and the hard example that you don't know whether they are positive or uh, false positive. Then we like use the retrained classifier to decide whether those hard negative are positive or negative. And through isolation, they added more positive to the trend. Okay. But kind of that helped with the trick in the fact. Okay. That's why I thought in the beginning that it uses iterations, because the more, if you have iterations, then you are retraining your model, and so you expect that the detection in the second stage is better than the first stage. Oh, okay. I have a question. I uh, was just going to ask you, when you're doing the subsampling of your large data set, are you doing that with replacement, or are you keeping track of which ones you already sample and then don't sample again from now on? Uh, it's, uh, we, we use a replacement, which means that the same sample can be selected for a different subset. Uh, I have three other questions. One question. How do you... Uh, find a threshold for your new classifiers. Do you adopt it using the source or not? Uh, basically, not. We we just. Uh, uh, I don't remember. <laughs> um, um, we use actually the decision values or the probabilistic Okay, we, we we just use the um, we we just it's a it's a linear uh, SVM, so we just use the the the, um, the values larger than one. Uh, I mean, as a positive, the the values uh, 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 the, the 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 detection uh, which are clustered in um, uh, before the spatial consensus are the positive windows which are uh, uh, whose confidence is larger equal or larger than one. So no, we, we didn't uh, uh, fix any threshold uh, for the same reason for which we don't have weights, because uh, uh, if you want to fix a threshold or if you want to, to transform the confidence in a probability, you need the supervised data. You can fit a, a logistic uh, to the confidence of the classifier and you have a probability. But you need the supervised data from the target. Uh, we could do this uh, using the source. Yeah, so if you have the source, there is like kind of yes. a ground yes. So if you change your threshold, you get different accuracies, and you can fix it where the, the threshold is giving yes. the best accuracy on the source, right? Yes. Yes, we, we could do this using the source. Uh, we could uh, fix the, the threshold using the source. But uh, since there is this difference between the source and the target, we, um, we basically, um, we, I, I have not tried. I mean, uh, they, the detector, which is 
the running gun the, the target. So the scaling the decision by the use makes a difference based on the sample. So if, if you have the evaluation set from source, you can tune it and understand you mean, that. You mean validation, right? Sorry, yeah, validation set from source. Then you can see that what decision values. So that's what basically you said. Like you said, like what the, the best threshold that maximizes your detection of your source is not necessarily the same, the best one for target demand. So. You don't want your classifier to be so much dependent on the source yeah. data. So you don't want to yeah. the source data. So. Um, mm, not, not necessarily what uh, works on the source can work on the target, but. Uh, Yes, we use uh, this uh, assumption for selecting the classifiers, so in principle, uh, maybe it can work also for uh, fixing the threshold. Uh, I have not tried. There is a, because you're using the Landsat -like algorithm, you can think of a, like a one way of doing that, because at each iteration you have a hypothesis that this, assuming that this is the best classifier, assuming these are all new layers, this is the best you can do, and you can do your scaling based on dual samples that you have. So that actually means the scaling of the decision values could be wrong as well, but that could go to part of the ransack track algorithms so that yeah. But we can I think we can discuss it in detail because there's uh, there's there's several things in there to talk about. I think uh, I have one last question. Okay. Uh, so in in all the ransack type of algorithms, you know, it's basically the jackknife strategy in a statistics, right? People do sampling, assuming that for, for outlier detection, that's probably the most like, um, common and basic way of doing any kind of outlier rejection. So the convergence and how, whether this method is successful or not, and if it is successful when it converges, it depends a lot on the percentage of outliers yes. in the, you know, in the whole pool of samples that you have. So. In your case, like what is that? I know that you, you wouldn't know the exact number because of the labeling issue, but what is the best case that you have on the percentage of outliers, the ratio of outliers over inliers? Um, using um, visual inspections, which means uh, just uh, uh, watching the, <coughs> the, um, the candidate pedestrians conducted by the generic uh, uh, detector, uh, the, the estimate is that we have a sort of 40-50% of uh, outliers. I would just say about 40% of uh, outliers, which is a very large number of outliers. And uh, that's why we build a, a very large set of uh, uh, initial classifiers in such a way that uh, the choice uh, can be done in a, in a very large pool. And you said you use 200 samples for training? Uh, yes, 200 samples which are mirrored uh, and we obtain 400. So it's in fact 100? It's, Sorry? It's in fact 100 mirrored becomes 200? Sorry? Like you said, you mirror, mirror the samples, right? So I'm saying it's in fact 100, but after mirroring it becomes uh, No, no, no. We, we randomly select 200 okay. samples and, and then we obtain 400 samples. 200 is um, we have, uh, uh, I think, uh, a, a couple of thousands of samples. Okay. The, the, the initial uh, pool of uh, the initial T, the initial uh, set of candidates, candidates is a couple so of thousands. Know the, like, in, like I said, the jackknife algorithms, in the size of the subset that you can select, uh, it has a direct relationship with the percentage of inliers over yes. outliers. So if you're expecting, say, 50% outlier, uh, probably 200 out of several thousand is a little too low. Basically, it could go higher. And, you know, it's a question whether we should get 200 um, or 100 or 500 or something. That's, that, you know, they prove that the, the answer to that question is based on the outlier. So uh, the outlier ratio. So I think. For your case, 200 out of several thousand is probably too low, given the fact that you're expecting 50% outlier. Um, that's because uh, in, uh, in every training set, uh, we still have outliers. So the training set is not uh, uh, clean. Right. Uh, yeah. But I mean, but, uh, you select the... 100, like you select the number of subsets, hoping to get one clean training set, right? Um, so hoping to have uh, a training set which is uh, sufficiently clean. Sufficiently clean, yes. And sufficiently large as well. Yes. So, 
the trade-off between those two. I can send you the rough. I mean, some of the um, that that okay. Uh, basically, the idea is that uh, in uh, uh, when you train uh, in SVM, the SVM is robust to a given number of outliers. So, the, the data set which is selected, uh, uh, the goal is not to select a completely clean data set, uh, um, which is basically usually the goal in RANSAC, or usually the demonstrations in RANSAC uh, about the probability of selecting uh, a clean data set uh, is done uh, with the assumption that you can select a data set with uh, only in liars. This is not our assumption, and in fact, you are right, 200. Uh, you don't need a completely clean data set, but at the same time, a larger training set would also improve the... So yes, if you, yes. If you sample more, there's more likelihood of bringing outliers in. And yes, so for sure, in the, we, we also visually inspected... Uh, we are, we, using visual inspection, uh, we, we watch the, the data set uh, corresponding to the, best uh, to the best classifiers, and also in that case we, we have uh, some outliers, uh, a minority, 10, uh, 20 percent of uh, outliers. But fortunately the SVM is robust to a given percentage of outliers. And on the other hand, if you have too many, uh, too few samples, uh, the SVM is not able to, I mean, it's a sort of compromise. If we choose uh, uh, smaller data sets, probably we are able to have completely clean uh, data sets, but they are too small for training an SVM, so it's a sort of compromise. Okay, thank you.